He was, that actually restored my faith in Twitter after, after yesterday. I'm, I'm pleased again. And now that, there's, now, we have, now that we have Twitter censors, I don't have to worry about getting embarrassed. Uh, so, okay, 15 minutes, 1443. I'm here to tell you that the operating system for money is obsolete. And it's optimized for a different era than the era we're living in today. It is old and it is incompatible with not just Web 2.0, but with an interneted world. That w the money we use in, in software terms is it's a legacy system to a very particular moment in history. And if we understand that moment in history, then we can understand how to make a better kind of money, and I would argue get very rich in doing so. Before the stuff that we call money was invented in the Renaissance, before this single monopoly currency was instituted, there were many currencies in operation at once. So if you lived in a small town, this is late Middle Ages Europe, if you lived in a small town, you would have your own currency in that town, and you would have the, the more universal currency of the empire or the early nation that you were living in. So you had more than one financial operating system you can use. Today, basically, you wake up, we know what money is. It's as if you woke up and every single computer in the world had Microsoft Windows 3.1 and that's it. That there was never anything else, you wouldn't even know that there was anything else. But these people had different money for different things. They had local currencies, which were abundance-based currencies. And these were based on grain, usually. You'd make grain in the fields, you'd bring it to the grain store, he would weigh it to store it, and he would give you a receipt for the amount of grain that you had brought him. And then you could use this receipt to buy and sell things. Right? You would tear a little piece off and you'd buy some chickens, you'd buy goats, you'd buy shoes, whatever you needed. And this was a currency, actually, that didn't grow over time. This is a currency that lost value over time. Each year, you would lose a certain amount of grain to spoilage or to rats or to something else. The grain store had to be paid. So every year, he would reissue that same currency. It would be devalued. So the bias of this currency was not towards saving. The bias of this currency, this particular medium, was towards spending. And people did spend. And people were actually getting really wealthy. I know we like to think of the Middle Ages as just this universally bad thousand years, but there were a few good things happening in the late Middle Ages, too. One of them was this massive creation of wealth that started to happen around 1100. And it was a big problem for the people who were already rich. Right? If you were from a big arist aristocracy, or you were from one of the big aristocratic families, or you were an early sort of proto-monarch or a failing feudal lord, you looked at the rising middle class, the bourgeois, and you were upset by this, because if people were getting wealthier, it meant you, by staying the same, were getting poorer. So what they did was they changed the operating system of money. Philippe de Fer is a great example. In, in France, one of, the, one of the guys who did this very quickly, what they did was said, all local currencies are illegal. And instead, you've got to use coin of the realm, right? which is central bank-issued, treasury, monarch-imprinted currency. And this, rather than being an abundance-based currency, is going to be a scarcity-based currency. Why do they want to use a scarcity-based currency? Because the monarch wants to be able to lend money into existence. Now it all goes through him. And now everybody competes for the currency that he issues between each other, and he's got as much money as he needs. Right? The way the monarch, the way the aristocracy then learned to make money was by lending money. Right? The money that we use today was created, and this is not a conspiracy, it's just an idea that they had. The money we use today was created so that rich people could stay rich by being rich rather than doing anything. That's what it's for. Right? So now we live in, a, in, a, in an economy where the sustenance of the economy itself is dependent on massive growth, at growth at the rate of interest. Because if you're going to borrow money and now you want to pay it back at interest, where do you get the other money? You're going to have to borrow that too. So the people lending the money end up getting richer, the people actually creating value 
end up getting poorer. Then we made corporations. What were they for? Corporations were really optimized to support this currency system. That's what they're for. Right? The only values that corporations have is to extract value, to do it fast and complete. And as long as you do that, it's all good. Right? This was the value of our society right through the industrial age. We had a scarce currency, we had scarce markets, and we had big companies trying to extract value out of people and out of places as efficiently as possible. Now, what's the problem with any of that? The problem with that is what happens if you get something that's abundant? How do you deal with something that you can't make scarce? What would happen if we developed a renewable energy source? You develop a renewable energy source, you're screwed. Because a renewable energy source is not optimized to that operating system. A renewable energy source means that we can just share this thing and have it. Well, what happens to all that money that's invested in the oil industry? What happens to that, that artificial scarcity? This is the kind of thing that Norbert Wiener was thinking about when cybernetics, when computers were first coming around. He started to imagine, well, what would happen if we have robots out there to do our farming for us? You know, do we just get to sit and relax? And have, how would our economy be able to cope with a world in which everything ends up being done? And computers at the beginning, networking at the beginning, seem to create some of these terrific problems for us. Right? Computers and networking changes the centrality of value creation. Because now with a $1,000 or $500 or now a $200 laptop, you can actually make something that creates value for yourself and other people. You're also able, through the net, in theory as a medium, to exchange value directly with one another rather than through a centralized currency, rather than through the bank. Now you could do what we would call peer-to-peer -peer value exchange. You know, that's sort of what, what eBay figured out on a certain level. And instead, what we've ended up doing is using the internet to try to extend the corporate industrial model to somehow extract more value out of people, to shrink time, and to optimize human beings to technology since technology is really more compatible with the values of efficiency than with the values of, well, all the other human values. So we end up in this early internet stage, which is where we're at now, with a lot of smart, smart people writing new laws of the new economy and new ideas on how business is going to happen. And these are always positioned as revolutionary new ideas for how to do business in a networked age, when what they actually are is extremely reactionary stances on how can traditional companies and traditional corporations maintain stranglehold over the economy even though there's this vastly liberative technology out there. Right? So you, you get, you get you know, Chris Anderson's free, which is about, oh, everything's free, so what do you do? Well, you've got to leverage the few things that aren't free. Right? So now you've got to write for free and do your articles for free and do all that, but you then talk for money. And then, well, if you come here and you're not talking for money, then you're leveraging that talk to sell this other thing. But what happens when you're leveraging everything you do to sell everything else, and everything's just leveraged? Then it's all free. You know, it's the kind of free that they talked about in the free market. You know, the idea of, uh, well, you know, World Bank will lend money to a country, and don't worry, you just you take this money and then open your markets to us, which means what? It's sort of like Google coming onto your website. Now you're open and free to, to Google Ads. And even here, I mean, and, and, and Tim O'Reilly and, and John Battelle are smart, smarter than me, but even their web cubed idea, which is smarter than I would come up with myself, still, what is the conclusion of web cubed? It's that the power will be won by the companies who can index or control the indexes through which we do everything. Nothing we do or create matters. The only thing that matters now is the ability to put an umbrella around all this stuff that we're doing for free. And I think we're mistaking what is free for what costs. Our work, our labor is not free. You know, open source and crowdsourcing are not the same things. 
Right? Open source is a bunch of people getting together to try to do something. Crowdsourcing is a company figuring out how to get a bunch of people to do something for it. Right? If I'm giving all my writing and this and that, and I'm just giving it for free to everyone who's blogging about it and everybody's got their Google AdSense, then we're all working for Google. The only thing that's actually free, or at least freer, are the means through which I can deliver stuff. I can deliver stuff without some of the corporate mediation of before. But with this false notion of free in our heads, we end up living in a value system that insists that everything we do must be open source and comments on. Right? How dare you put up a blog post and you put comments off? <gasps> Everything you write, everything you say, everything you think, everything you feel is supposed to be out there, it's supposed to be free. I mean, you try, try even putting a link to something with DRM, D Digital Rights Management, on Boing Boing, and you'll get in trouble because that goes against the philosophy. You shouldn't protect everything I do is yours. Not even just yours. Everything I do is the hives. This is what leads, ultimately, to copying to a, a society of copying, to no originality, to this sort of DJing of culture. That's why we haven't had new music in 20 years, or why the, late, the biggest TV movie now is The Prisoner, which is a remake. Uh, ugh. I mean, what really, and even in the open source movement, what did the open source movement give us so far? Copies of things. Maybe better copies, but copies. We got a copy of Unix, a copy of Encyclopedia Britannica, a copy of Netscape. You know, copy protection really means what? Protecting me from all these copies of things. You know, where's the Creative Commons law? Where's the Creative Commons license that I can say, okay, you can have it for free, but at least you just have to ask me for it? Free if you send me an email? I just want, I just want to give it to you rather than to, than to it. As a result of all this freedom, the abundance of creative material, the abundance of genuine creative output is declining. We are actually getting the scarce marketplace demanded by our legacy currency system. The same way the early Renaissance got a scarcity of labor by killing off half the people with the plague. The alternative, and we've got two and a half minutes to get it, the alternative is two things. One is the development of a digital culture that actually respects the labor of individuals, right? My writing is my writing. It is not a medium for Google Ads. And second, the creation of new modes of currency based in abundance rather than scarcity. And I'm talking, yeah, about genuine alternative digital currencies. The original PayPal dream before bankers went to government and said, you have to regulate them like a bank. This is illegal. Don't let anyone else do it. This is not nuts. I mean, 20 years ago, we were all telling, probably if you were alive, you were telling people they were going to be using email someday, and they all laughed you out of the room. Amazon was a big deal. Craigslist was a big deal. eBay was a big deal. This is actually easier and less of a stretch and actually needed. I, I contend the next big thing, if there is a big thing, it's a lot of small things, actually, but the people who will make the next big amount of money are the people who create genuine alternative electronic currencies and means of peer-to-peer -peer exchange that do not involve cash. Cash is artificially scarce. Cash has been taken away. It's out of the system. Cash has lost its utility value as it's been sucked out into investment capital, into the speculative marketplace. The only real competition to a Google universe, and nothing necessarily wrong with a Google universe, but let's have a few alternatives. The only real possible competition to Google and their economy of faux openness would be peer-to-peer -peer exchange. There's a few versions out there. They're primitive, though. There's Time Dollars is out there for, for people in communities locally to try to do it. ITEX is an interesting one for business-to-business -business kind of barter. There's a more advanced one I've been looking at called Superfluid. Check that one out, superfluid.biz which is kind of the next generation for both peer-to-peer -peer and business-to-business -business exchange with an alternative currency called quids. I don't believe we are suffering from an abundance of creativity, just an abundance of productivity, efficiency, and openness. 
You know, if web cubed leads to aggregators and indexes, then peer-to-peer, -peer, genuine peer-to-peer -peer would lead to bottom-up value creation. I don't think this next era in the internet is about scaling up anymore. I think it's about figuring out how to exchange value instead of extracting value. We are, we are at a crossroads. Right now, we have the ability to optimize our systems, our technologies, and our currency to humans rather than optimizing humans to them. And I implore you to do that. And I think you will be happy and rich as a result. Thank you.